Hallelujah. I, I, I also want to, I promise that we would be just sharing something with you today uh, that um, is going to happen in our church. Uh, and I'm really glad to tell you this, but you recall that when last November, when uh, I was appointed to the, of, the, the, the office in uh, Foursquare, uh, that uh, we felt we needed to maintain uh, Eternal's momentum and growth, but it would only be possible through uh, having some people and resource to help. And um, some of you may or may not be aware, but we appointed Anne-Marie uh, as uh, admin. So she works one day a week for us. These people that I'm going to mention do much more than, than just what we actually pay them. But uh, that, because part of this is ministry. But, but Anne-Marie, we, uh, we appointed to one day a week. One, one of the, those early thoughts I had was to actually ask Pastor Chris, who works four days a week for table, to consider coming and helping at Eternal, and mainly to cover things for when I'm not here and so on. Um, so I'm glad to tell you today that Pastor Chris is going to work a half a day a week for us um, from the first from May the first. The council's approved that. Um, again, we know it's tokenism in terms of uh, you know in terms of the actual amount of work that they do and the giving that uh, that they that they give to Eternal. But it's, um, his role is going to be his teaching and preaching pastor, so it's really great to have him on board. I, I just want to say some things, and I'll talk more about this when we, when we pray him in on the 17th, uh, when he speaks, the day that he speaks here next month, um, that Chris has saved my life. <laughs> he really has. You know, he's a great advisor, great counselor. Uh, he, when I want to rush off on something, Chris holds me back a bit and says, have you thought about this? Uh, you know, get that right. But it's absolutely saved my life. So uh, uh, it's, been such a, it's been such an essential person in my life. Has really spoken vision to me, uh, things, that, you know, things that I didn't see that he felt God. So there's a prophetic element on his life. Uh, but we, I'm so thankful and so glad that he's going to do that for us. Amen. Thank you, Chris. And, uh, you know, I need to just acknowledge today that Anne-Marie just has been such a help in the, her role in administration, again, doing much more. And, uh, and you know, my, the other person who is saving my life on a daily basis is Jenny. Jenny Jenny's works the admin office for... Uh, for four, four square, but just helps out so much. It's just incredible. And uh, they, you know, I'm not exaggerating when I, they take such a load, just do it with such calm and with such ease. It really is amazing. Hallelujah. Well, bless the Lord. So, yeah, amen. Give her a hand. Uh, uh, I think it was Joe who said yesterday, you know, she's got the right balance of firmness and ministry for you. She said, it tells you when you shouldn't be doing something. It's kind of right. It is, amen. It is there. Uh, hallelujah. Bless the Lord. All right. Well, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. I want to share some thoughts with you. It was interesting that Chris spoke about today about, in, just as we came out of worship, about the battle lines that are drawn uh, that, and, and the empowering of Christ. Um, of his disciples of the church and I want to take our thoughts just around to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 16 um, uh, well we're going to read from we'll actually read from verse 18 and I want to just share some some things from this passage of scripture that I believe are relevant for us you know the the um, these are Christ these are Christ this is Christ's final instruction to the church, and uh, you, you, there's, it's not hard to get a sense of this, that, that what Jesus is, t is talking about here is, is so critically important. Um, those sort of closing statements that we get a, uh, a perspective of or that we know in, uh, just in our lives, you know, where we've experienced uh, a statement where someone is talking to us in a, in a final sense about something, um, those sort of words that can actually be very much life-shaping or they can be very directional about what we do, you know? Uh, I remember um, 
uh, one of the things, I think migrants know this, people who migrate from their family and who leave home, uh, when you're standing at that airport and you're making a statement about what, you know, and you're making those final remarks to people that you're leaving behind, uh, sometimes those, and you, and you know you never might see them again. Uh, um, my, my mom and dad, when they migrated in, uh, it was 1978, and her dad was there, uh, you know, yet unsaved at that time. Her dad was there, and I was within earshot of my mom, so this is a long time ago. I was in my 20s. But I remember exactly the conversation of my mom with her father. You know, where she, where she, and because of his life, and my mother never misses an opportunity to preach a sermon. For those of you who know, you know, she said, like a one-line sermon, you can get it. Uh, and she said, she said to him, Dad, will I ever see you again? And uh, uh, I remember him standing in a lime green suit. Uh, I, I don't know that he even answered her question. Well, well, I remember what she asked him. And uh, she never did again. She never saw her father again. That was the last time she saw him. But he did find Jesus, Amen. So, but you know, th those statements, and I think we've got them in the room here. I think we've been with people who've said something to us, sometimes not in that kind of a serious situation, but sometimes yes, sometimes when people are dying and you've, they've said things to you. But sometimes when a teacher has said something to you, someone has just said something to you, and those words where you know that you're never gonna see them again, those last statements stick. And here, as we come to Matthew chapter 28, there's the sense that Jesus is now doing exactly that. He's giving them a statement about what is going to happen. And uh, I, I'm, I've just felt, you know, I felt drawn to, um, to what has become uh, such a powerful mobilizing statement of the church. That, he, that here with these people who were standing around uh, and you, we don't feel the emotion of it, but there were some emotions there. There were people that were amazed uh, about what had happened. Some still trying to catch up with it. Some still struggling with doubt at a time like this. And Jesus is in these very short passage here is mobilizing the church. It is extraordinary. And uh, so let's just read that and I'll make some remarks about that. And so from verse 18, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore go and make uh, disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Let's just pray for a moment. Father, thank you. So we ask the Holy Spirit to just come and be here. To come and be the one who speaks to us, dear Lord. Uh, open our eyes, focus our, our minds and our hearts. And impart something of Jesus. Let us see Jesus, I pray. Amen. There's, um, um, there's the, what happens in this passage, uh, where Jesus is talking about typically how you would give those kind of instructions. He's talking, uh, uh, and, and these sentences are short, and what he's talking about is quite broad. He's talking about, the, about his authority. You know, it's those final sentence, those final moment remark sentences. They're fairly short, but they're packed with uh, significance and with meaning. And he says uh, about his authority. You know, he's disclosing significant truth in the midst of all of that, the, the, what's happening here. He's, he's unsurpassed authority. He, he talks about in 12 words. In, in, he says... I have all authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. He commissions his disciples, indeed the church, in one sentence. He says you got to go and make disciples of all men. Just does it in one sentence. 
And he speaks about his abiding presence in 14 words. They are in three sentences, Jesus mobilizing the church and declaring significant things over it. Because what is happening in this narrative as he commissions them, in this story, as he commissions them, uh, some significant things are happening. Um, and we want to, I want to spend some time today just on those, uh, just as we make observation on that, that I hope today just refocuses us on Jesus and what he's saying. Does that, that for us as individually, from, you know, as, as individuals, but as a church, just focus us, us again on, the, on, the, on this closing message of Jesus, which is continued over the centuries, over the years. And then next week, talk about how this practically uh, unfolds for us as a community and as a church here. You know, about attitudes, about diversity, about working while it's day. So, but today, just want to focus on those things that Jesus, on how it actually relates to us. And... Um, uh, and, and what unfolds in this story is, 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 is not just uh, something that Jesus is saying to the church, but Jesus is making another declaration. He is making a declaration that there is a new king uh, who has come. Amen? Hallelujah. That, that, this com that this great commission is making declaration that he is king. Amen? And that he is, and that, he, and, that, and that power and honor belong to him. Hallelujah. And, uh, and, and, also, and, and then goes on to say that, uh, that supreme authority belongs to this new king. Amen. And that we, uh, uh, and, that, and, and then empowers his followers with what they are to do. This is the extraordinary unfolding of these verses given to these few disciples on the mountain that still apply today, that unleash a, a, you know, a phenomena that no, no force can stop. And uh, Jesus is doing this in the simple context, and, it, and the application comes to us today. That, that, that this is the call of Christ on our lives. This is the assignment that we have. What is Jesus saying to us out of this? So in this statement, uh, Jesus, in the summation statement, this summary statement, Jesus is mobilizing the church uh, into what is such an extraordinary uh, um, what is, you know, entity and body. And um, it, it's not the first time that he's talking to them about this. They've been on a, they've been on a mission before. He's had them going out. Uh, he has taught them. He has uh, shown in his life as an example to them. So when they're standing there, Jesus is bringing together everything that has happened. And he's saying, now this is the next step. This is where you go. He's also making a statement here uh, to all nations, hallelujah. We, you know, he's making the sta statement primarily to Jews that are standing there uh, and, and saying to Jews uh, that they're included in it, amen? <laughs> I mean, they've got, they're actually there. They're the ones who begin with us. Um, and all nations are included, hallelujah. So we never forget that. We never forget that, that Jesus, the message of the kingdom is to Jews also. Amen? Hallelujah. And then he, uh, and, and, it, and, it, and, and when Jesus releases this, when, it, when he talks about this, he's laying incredible claim on their lives. He's laying a claim that says, you know, this is what I want you to do with your life. This is what I want you, this is how you, this is the purpose of your life. It is to go and make disciples. It is to be a discipler, to be a follower of Jesus. He is making that claim on every follower. Saying that this is the only way to the Father. 
You know, that we cannot change, water down, uh, bring another version in. There isn't another option. This is it. That Jesus is the way to the Father. The only redemptive way to the Father. And Christ alone makes it possible. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The second, the second point, so... The first is that in this statement, Jesus mobilizes the church. Just in the summary statement, he mobilizes the church. In the second point, he defines the life of a believer. That, uh, that, um, that what it means to be a follower of Christ, uh, to lay your life down, to lose your life for his sake, uh, is what he's asking. You know, everybody... Everybody wants to know. I think it's the great question of our lives about what is the purpose of my life? What's my life worth? What do I want to actually invest my life in? Uh, uh, there's a, I was reading something from Stephen Co Covey who, read, who wrote the seven, uh, effective habits of a, the seven habits of an effective person, said, said this. He said that if the ladder is not leaning against the right wall, every step just gets you to the wrong place faster. It's the truth, isn't it? And what, but what Jesus is, and what Jesus is doing here is articulating a kingdom way to live that will fulfill our lives. You know, I think about people whose lives faithfully serve God, decades in, decades out. People that are sitting in this room and others that you know uh, that live a life, and you wonder what is it that actually makes people. Continue on, sometimes through incredible hardship. Live a life that is selfless, that is giving, that seems to count no cost, that, that moves, doesn't do, turn to the right or to the left, but just serves God. What is it that actually makes people do that? Because, because in the way that Jesus demands everything of these disciples, he demands nothing. He doesn't say that you have to do this. And he asks everything. He says, you lay your life. I ask for your life. I ask you to give me your life. But we have the choice on that. It's not, it's not that we have to. But you know, the, for me, uh, I become more convinced as I've watched people's lives over the years that the greatest fulfillment, the least regret is from people who I find have dedicated their life in service to Christ. You can have a lot of argument with that. You can have, and that's not the easiest thing to do. That's not the easiest thing to do. To lay your life down, to take the priority uh, that I'll serve God, that'll be the first thing that I do, and not to resist in self-determination, which is such an easy thing for us to do. Where we fit Christ somehow into uh, our lives <laughs> and make uh, some easing of our conscience by saying, you know what, it's not like I'm totally not doing anything. But you don't get the sense of that in what Jesus is saying here. So go and make disciples. Go and make them. And it, it, you know, and, and it, and it and, it, and thinking about this, you have to think about what Jesus is actually saying. So he's saying, he is, and for me there are two things, there are two important divisions in terms of what Jesus is actually saying. He's saying to them, here is an aspect of how you need to introduce people to Christ. And on how that spiritual experience is number one. That encountering the Spirit is essential. 
that the works of miracles are going to come by the Spirit and there are some things that are sovereignly so uh, an act of grace and an act of God. And then there's something else that's inferred in here. And that is an organizational aspect of effort. That he says you're to go. <laughs> you go, you're to, you're to make disciples of all men. There's a sense that what Jesus is establishing here is process. You know, a process of how this ought to work. Um, uh, a fact that it needs some... Um, some organization, some commitment, some allocation of resources. It needs people to go and do this. It's like this is disciples, what you're to do. You're somehow to cover this off. You're to, you're to cover off being connected to people. You're to cover off being in different places. There needs to be some way in which you carry this message to people. And I think that that's true. I think that the message of the church, the, 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 the involvement of of our contribution in the message and the reach of Christ to people is absolutely clear. That the fields are white to harvest, but it needs laborers, amen? That we need to be there. But let me say this. Let me say this. That in no way can you separate the need for Christ in every endeavor and the power of the Spirit. That Jesus says, I will build my church, underwrites the growth of the church through his own involvement. But there is an aspect of that. We have to uh, understand that living this out in some way that gets this gospel to people and shares this with people is something God has entrusted to us. Amen. Well, let me finish with this. This commission is characterized by three traits. When Jesus is talking about this, is there, there, are, there are things that he has brought through to this point that um, maybe talk about this some more next week, but I want to just close with them and maybe Debbie uh, Crystal can come. And these three things, well, you see them, well, you see it in John 17 in Jesus' prayer when he says, Father, I pray that there'll be one. I pray for unity amongst them. Pray that in this great assignment and responsibility that I have given, that people will be one. That they will have uh, those qualities that embrace each other. And that secondly, um, love will prevail. That all men will know by this that we are the disciples of Jesus. Amen. That we love one another. Hallelujah. And that we pray. That we pray. That we cannot build anything of a church here, anywhere, without prayer, without the help of God. Amen. Amen. Let's just close our eyes.